Hello, I'm Dr Karen Burns. It's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to the Melbourne School of Design and the University of Melbourne and to our beautiful new building. Um, before I introduce Dr Rory Hyde, I'd like you to ask you all just to take a moment um, so that we can collectively acknowledge that we're meeting here tonight in Wurundjeri country, the country that traditionally belongs to the Wurundjeri people, the Eastern Kulin Nation. And to ask you all to take a moment so that we can pay our respects to their elders, past and present, particularly as we are on this journey <laughs> of reconciliation together, and particularly in the lead up to the 50th anniversary of the 1967 Australian referendum. So tonight we welcome an expatriate <coughs> Melbourneian home. You never get to leave, it's like family. Dr Rory Hyde, as many of you will know, graduated with a B.Arc and a PhD in architecture from RMIT University. He worked for the local architectural practice BKK. In 2009, he went to the Netherlands. He was there for almost four years. And whilst he was there, he worked for an illustrious firm, MRDRV, whose name I still can't get right after all these years. Um, he was also associated with um, a number of eminent architecture and design magazines in the Netherlands. And whilst he was there, he undertook the research that culminated in his book, um, Future Practice, which was published by Routledge in 2012 and won the Bates Smart um, Architecture in the Media Prize. Then Rory returned to um, England after working here in the Masters of Architecture. He's currently still with us as a senior adjunct fellow, but of course, as many of you will know, he was invited to take up the position as Curator of Contemporary Architecture and Urbanism at the V&A Museum in London. And he's come here tonight to tell us about what he's currently doing in that extraordinary design museum. Thank you, Rory. Um, thanks so much, Karen, for that great introduction, and thanks to Alan and the school for having me. Um, it's great to be back, um, and nice to see lots of friends and familiar faces in the room. Good turnout, eh? Hey? Um, I am going to give a talk about this exhibition, All of This Belongs to You. Um, it's not really about architecture, it's more about public space. Um, it's more about institutions, and it's, it's more about public discourse and how we can shape it. Um, I'm going to start with a, first of all, with a clip from the late, great Robert Hughes, 1979. It's the final episode in The Shock of the New where he projects forward to the future of museums and the future of art. Robert Hughes. The museum has its own architecture, its own traditions, which don't fit here. <laughs> Clearly the museum can't handle all art. You can't fit a whole landscape with 400 tax deductible spikes into it and it's not a good place for small fleeting gestures because gestures don't sit well in a permanent collection. Nor is it a good place for getting shot at in or half drowned in or getting covered in goat guts or experiencing any one of the other various things that body artists over the years have chosen to do to their bodies. Every institution has its limits, though it may try not to observe them. You have to think of museums as broadcasting on a given frequency, and not all the signals coming out of the culture can get on that one wavelength. This is not the museum's fault. A museum can no more contain all culture than a zoo can hold all nature. Um, I wanted to pull out this quote though. Uh, Every institution has its limits, although we may try not to observe them. 
So um, the exhibition I'm going to talk about today, all of this belongs to you, um, is sort of about responding to this challenge laid down by Hughes. Um, can we take this big stuffy place that is the v &A and somehow turn it inside out? Can we get it to do things which it's not designed to do? Can we get it to broadcast on the most important frequencies coming out of a culture? Um, how can we engage in the most urgent questions of public life? Um, can the museum be a place of radical thought? So, on the surface, the v &A, as I said, is not that place. It's a kind of fortress of culture, 150 years of history um, solidified into this brooding castle. Um, and that baggage is both real, it's, it's, it's what it's done, it's what it's achieved, it's also what its expectations are from the public, are somehow equally solidified and associated with this building. Um, current shows include McQueen, uh, shoes, luxury. Um, so there's a sort of idea about this is the place for the finest things, the elite, the, the most um, spectacular and um, special examples of design, art and design today. Can this be a place for new ways of thinking, for new ways of acting? Um, behind that stuffy exterior lies a more radical past, though. Um, this really tells the history of the V&A in one um, freeze. It's above what used to be the main entrance, 1850s, late 1850s. Um, in the centre, you see Queen Victoria, arms outstretched, receiving gifts from across the empire. Um, they're all sort of meekly climbing the stairs to hand them to their master. Um, in the background, this black shape, you can see the silhouette of the Crystal Palace, um, Paxton's Crystal Palace. Of course, the V&A grew out of the 1851 Great Exhibition um, as a way to kind of solidify that process of, collective, of bringing all the greatest works of design together and creating a public exhibition out of it, um, both to, well, improve um, and inspire designers, but also to create a more informed uh, commercial public. Um, it was the brainchild of this man, Henry Cole, um, and I love this quote. Uh, he created the V&A to be a powerful antidote to the gin palace. Um, so gin palaces must have been great. And, um, but the point is, yes, can museum, can culture be a force for social improvement? Um, and it sounds very patronising today. It sounds very simplistic. You can come and be exposed to the finest things and somehow you're elevated as a person. But I, and I think we, see some small truth in that which we want to um, maintain. Um, how he achieved that was through some technological means. It's the first museum to have gas lighting, first museum to have a cafe, and this is the William Morris room, which is still there. Um, and those two things, along with late opening hours, meant that the working class could attend the museum. So, um, whereas before they were really royal collections which had become public in a sense, but really just for the bourgeois class, um, late opening hours meant that after your day of toil, you could come and have a meal and wander around under the gas lighting. So it's an incredibly democratic gesture. Um, and Henry Cole took this idea of public very seriously, that it's, it's really for everybody. Um, the William Morris Room. There is, of course, some sort of contradiction at the core here. I'll give you a minute to read this great cartoon by Tom Gould. His, uh, William Morris's beard calls Lord <laughs> Warplestone a pompous capitalist leech. <laughs> um, and, of course, this is, this is the sort of twin ironies happening here. On the one hand, Morris, Ruskin, um, the Victorian uh, progressives believe in the power of art and craft to, um, you know, create a socialist utopia, um, whereas they're also uh, designing wallpaper for the elite. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, these are the sort of touchstones, the histories that we find within the institution, which we can reach back to as a sort of justification for the type of work we're doing today. Um, I'm going to just show one project before we get into all of this belongs to you. 
Um, it's called Rapid Response Collecting. It's really a project of my colleagues, um, Kieran Long and Karina Gardner, who set it up, but we, we all, as a design team, contribute objects to it. Um, as the name suggests, it's about getting objects into the museum as quickly as possible. Um, and in that, what that means is that you can keep up with debate, you can keep up with public conversation, you can keep up with the issues that are out in the world. Um, so a few examples. This is our display. I mean, the, one of the, it, it sort of looks not like much, but there's a few tricks here which enable us to be very fast. Um, the cases are lined in metal, um, and we spent the rest of the tiny budget on a printer in our office that could print onto magnetic labels, which we could then design, print, cut out, and stick on the wall within a couple of hours, um, rather than going through the process of the museum's um, text approval and design process, which can take a couple of weeks. So we can now get an object in the door and on display within a couple of days. Um, and this is our most Many thoughts, this sensational couldn't be done. object. A moment to celebrate for its maker. But could this plastic firearm have grave implications for gun control around the world? All of the major parts of this weapon have been created with this $8,000 3D printer. Computer designs are fed in, and the machine builds each component from layer upon layer of plastic. Untraceable and potentially undetectable, and now Cody Wilson plans to make his blueprints freely available online. There are states all over the world outside the United States that believe, uh, or that say, we're a gun control state, you can't own a firearm. That's not true anymore. Aren't you worried about the kinds of people who will be using this technology? I recognise that the tool might be used yeah, to harm other people. It's what it is, it's a gun. But um, again, I don't think that's a reason to not do it or a reason to not put it out there. So uh, about a week after that um, BBC clip aired, my colleague Louise Shannon got on a plane to meet Cody Wilson in Texas. Um, she was terrified, uh, <laughs> met him in a public place. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he turns out to be a lovely guy. He's a law student. Um, from Texas, he, um, yeah, as I said, he's a lovely guy. He just happens to really, really believe in the Second Amendment, um, and uh, that's a sort of unbridgeable gap. But as a as a way to kind of force that logic upon the entire world, so as as the report said, he created this 3D file, uploaded it onto the internet, and gave it away for free that anybody could download and therefore print out their own untraceable gun. Um, he is inadvertently a designer. He's made something which has kind of changed the world. Um, this very benign technology that we all celebrate for the maker movement, the 3D printer, somehow immediately becomes sinister. You can't take that thing out of the world anymore. Like, the world's fundamentally changed. And I think these are the objects that we see real power in. Um, and by putting them in the museum, we're able to create a forum, a space for discussion to understand the implications of these things, for our public lives. So um, in the course of that, that object there is a locally made print. Um, the 3D printing office that we used um, had ethical problems with the um, project, so they created it with an extra millimetre surrounding all the parts so that it could not be assembled. So um, it could never therefore be fired and they could ne never therefore be, um, well, they would never lose sleep. Um, we then, Louise then over the course of a year negotiated with Cody and with the US authorities for him to, and of course this is somebody who they've like shut down, they tried to arrest but they couldn't because the laws didn't exist. Um, over the year uh, had him classified as an arms, a registered arms uh, dealer. Um, so he was able to export this um, shipment of all his prototypes to us in London. Um, including this one, which we have on display at the moment, which is uh, zero number 001, so the very first trial of this as an idea. Um, and as you can see, instead of a trigger, it has a little loop, which they could attach a string to, to set it off while it's in a um, vice, rather than, because they weren't ready to hold it themselves. Um, so, yeah, this obviously had some response in the, excuse me, in the media. Uh, from the kind of indifferent to the outraged to the sensational 
Um, but of course, we like the media. We caught these types of stories because we want to have that debate. We want to be the place that can have the debate around objects, um, and we see the media as, as a kind of partner in that, in a way. Um, and that, just to quickly click through a couple of other objects in this display before we move on to the show. Um, another one, which is more about resetting the taste regime of a place like the V&A. Um, so these are uh, Katy Perry endorsed fake eyelashes manufactured by the British company Eyelure. Um, they were given to the museum by an investigative journalist who broke a story about their manufacture in Indonesia. Um, so we describe them as a kind of vector object. They, they connect the most famous woman in the world, or the woman at least with the most Twitter followers, Katy Perry, to the least. Um, this woman who is making them in Indonesia and the work which is so detailed and, um, and difficult that it damages your eyes after a few months. So, again, it's a sort of activist acquisition, if you like. Um, there are some happy stories here, too. Uh, this is a kind of straightforward story of design product innovation. Um, it's called Ultra, Ultra Rope. It's manufactured by Kone, the Finnish lift company. Um, and it's a carbon fiber lift cable that is r amazing. Um, it can go 10 times higher than a steel one. And so we see this as kind of opening the door to a new way of traversing very tall buildings vertically. Um, and it's fun to just put it on display here in the museum. It's something you'll otherwise never see. So that's kind of nice. Um, Karen Burns, when she came and gave, us, gave a talk to us, described this neon sign as I saw the, the most generous statement of publicness, but one which is inevitably connected through to the private electricity company in the street. <laughs> and I love this idea that our glowing neon letters, um, which are here one metre high in the entrance of the, of the V&A, um, are somehow pushing back against the, the, um, the context in which they exist. We see it as a generous statement, as an idealistic statement, as a statement about all that we can achieve together as a civilization. And, and um, on the one hand, of course, it's incredibly obvious as a national collection, of course, all the things in the v &A belong to you, belong to us. Um, it's, it's a, we also hope it's a gentle provocation um, that somehow, if all of it does belong to you, then what are you going to do with it? How are you going to look after it? Um, and who is the you in this phrase? Um, is it the you who attends museums or is it the you who doesn't? And what does, it, what does that mean? So we kind of set this up as a challenge both to our visitors, to our colleagues and to ourselves. And then through a series of um, installations and displays which I'm going to take you through now, um, I will yeah, see how we did in, in responding to that challenge. Um, the original proposal well, the challenge, <laughs> we, we were challenged from the beginning. So this was the original proposal to have it on the outside of the building, to kind of make this statement into the public space, into the street. Um, and really, that's the image that that bit of crappy Photoshop of mine that won us the show. It, got, it gave us the opportunity to do it. The, the director thought it was such a kind of, um, you know, the type of statement that the museum needed to make, the type of statement that he wanted to stand behind. Um, and it seemed to, yeah, capture this logic, that the, this transformation that the museum's undergoing, trying to turn itself inside out, trying to become that um, public sphere rather than just a public collection. Um, <laughs> we didn't manage to do it like that. This was one of the um, residents who objected. Um, and, you know... I thought that was great. It means you're on the right track, doesn't it? If someone... <laughs> yes, we're cheaper in the museum. Yes, this place is elite already. So we're trying to, um, you know, overcome that. We did, though, release a series of T-shirts which on the swing tag explained why, how we didn't get planning permission. So I thought that was sort of nice and subversive. Um, so we had to move it inside. We thought that was better anyway. And um, these great pictures by Max Creasy, who's a Melbourne photographer who came and um, yeah, d took most of the pictures in the, in the show, um, yeah, really tries to... It, it's, it's, it's impossible to describe through, through pictures, but it's, 
it's really a spatial statement. It sits there as a kind of object. Um, it becomes more ambiguous, I think, by being inside as to what it refers to. Um, what is this? Is this this arch that we're attached to? Is it the thing behind it, Jesus? Is it the building itself, the people who work there, the space that we're, we're standing in, um, or the other people who, who um, yeah, are visiting? Um, and again, this provocation. Um, if all of it does belong to you, what are you going to do with it? Um, there is no gallery. It's just a series of interventions. So you get this map, um, which allows you to navigate. Um, it's sort of, yeah, in, uh, acupunctural, if you like, responding to the spaces, responding to the existing um, building itself. There's four artworks. The first is by Muff, who are a um, London-based architecture practice. Um, it's called More Than One Fragile Thing at a Time. Uh, and really, our brief to them, in a way, was to give them this space. So this is the Medieval and Renaissance Gallery. Um, it's, the, it's a kind of archetypal public space within the museum. Um, it's got daylight. It's got a paved surface. It's got the standing figure sculptures, um, fountains, even one that works these external architectural elements. But what we felt it was missing is, well, discourse or politics or the other um, characteristics that make up a true public space. So that was our um, brief to Muff. Uh, what can you do? How can you, how can you take over this, this room? They introduced a couple of really simple interventions. So these squishy props, which you can sit on. Um, and that's simply about saying, this is a quiet, dry, daylit space that um, is free to enter, that you are not obliged to buy a coffee in, um, that you don't have to buy a ticket for, that you can sit in all day. And so we're going to give you a squishy spot to enable you to actually do that physically. The other aspect of their project is to really look very closely and to derive their thinking from the collection itself. So um, they became interested in this sculpture in the top left, uh, which is the Misericordia. Um, from Venice. Uh, it's a, well, 15th century sculpture um, of a Madonna. And as you can see, it's a kind of, it's a, it's, they describe it as a diagram of charity. So this Madonna is holding open her cloak, um, and underneath it are a series of people sheltering. Um, this object once stood on the front of this building. Um, which is now in Venice, and you can actually see, well, well it, it is now, it was, and it will continue to be in Venice. Um, you can see the, the scar in the center where that object has been taken from or, or was pulled off and sold, which, you know, is a kind of powerful thing in itself to, to remember that um, everything in this museum once had a spot, um, and there it is. <laughs> a, 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 a you know, muddy scar in Venice. Um, and they talk about this idea of reverse restitution. So rather than taking that sculpture back to Venice um, as, you know, as the um, Parthenon marbles um, would, would, or some people would like that to happen, uh, you instead bring some of this context into the museum. So a sort of reversing of this restitution idea. Um, as I mentioned, that building in Venice was a charity, um, and so they engaged a local London-based charity called um, Women for Women Refugees, um, who, as the name suggests, provide legal advice, um, language lessons, housing advice to uh, women refugees. Um, they designed these series of tables, uh, which sat underneath this, this um, choir screen. Um, which would enable uh, the refugee organisation to have their language lessons in the, ga in the gallery um, each week. So it's, it's a very simple gesture, but as you can see, the design of the table creates this intimacy around this artwork, which our conservators were very um, concerned would be, you know, a chair would be leant back against it or something. So it somehow is a generous gesture. It allows you to get very close to the work and to have a different type of experience within the gallery. Um, I haven't got images of, of the refugees because we didn't um, want to ask their permission for, to, for, to be photographed. But we do have this lovely video of some Italian pensioners singing quiet songs. <laughs> so this is a kind of uh, intuition. Sorry. 
Um, Bob and Roberta Smith, who's an artist who campaigned or who ran against the Education Secret Secretary Michael Gove um, as an artist on the, on the platform, all schools should be art schools, which I think is one we can all believe in. Another one of his provocations is audience, audiences should look like taxpayers. Um, and I think that's something that we try to remind ourselves. And it's, a, it's like really damn hard to live up to. But I love this video of Italian pensioners because somehow you feel they're paying tax. Um, Jorge Oterapayos is a Spanish-American uh, artist, architect, architectural preservationist. Um, he works with a material called Artemundit, which is a um, conservation latex, which um, architectural preservation or conservators rather will paint onto a sculpture or a bit of building. Um, and when you peel it off, it lifts off the dirt and dust. So he's, he's interested in, in, sorry, and then his practice is to exhibit that material rather than throw it away. Um, here he is looking at the base of Trajan's column, which is the largest um, object in the museum. Um, it's a plaster cast of, the, of this one in Rome from AD 113. Um, and this, these, this object was then copied um, one to one and rebuilt within the V&A. So this is an image from the 1860s of the, of the um, construction. And you can see these panels being assembled around the brick chimney which they built um, to support those, those um, panels. A number of copies were made, but the V&A's one is the only one that's kind of intact. They're, otherwise, they're, they're kind of linear. Um, and this is the uh, cascots as they are today. Jorge became kind of obsessed in this strange circularity of narratives which exist between the um, original column in Rome and the copy in London. Um, so the, as a conservator, he's well aware of the issues of pollution which have affected the ancient monuments all over Europe, especially the um, Trajan's Column. So what in, as the Industrial Revolution gained steam, um, literally, and coal and gas and pollution, circulated around the world and attached themselves to buildings, uh, objects like, the tra like Trajan's Column began to be severely eroded to the point where the conservators operating in Rome now come to the v &A to look at our copy, um, to yeah, look at the finer details to help them make decisions. Um, wh what this means is, is, is it kind of changes the, na the, the nature of what's original, what's a copy. Yeah, th this room becomes not just a room of references of, uh, of, a, of a Europe beyond, but somehow a space to think about questions of time or secularity or atemporality. So he wanted to, and of course, what makes that kind of that story ironic is that the V&A's column is attached to a chimney. And we went and did the, um, into the archives and found the original contract. And it was that the, the museum commissioned a builder who would normally build factories to um, build, his, build their column. So there, there is literally what connects these two is pollution, is the Industrial Revolution. And he became very interested in this. So he, he applied his latex to the inside of this column painted it on over the course of a week, um, peeled it all off, pulled it out the door, stretched it out on the floor, and then suspended it from the ceiling as a kind of ghost column, um, exhibiting all the 150 years of dirt and dust and pollution that had accumulated on the inside of this other um, hollow column. I love this woman, she's really like taking it in. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see here in this image the brick pattern um, which comes through from, this, from this, the inside of this chimney. So this once invisible object, this invisible chimney, um, now becomes kind of centre stage. Um, he's, he's literally turned that object inside out. Um, and it, it's one of the phrases that we used when we're commissioning all these works is, is it it's at once needs to be an artwork, but it also needs to do work. So it can't simply be something which you stand back and um, admire. It needs to somehow reel you in, either with a story like that, 
or literally this was a collaboration with our conservation department. So it, it's really performing a kind of service or exhibiting the service of maintaining a collection. Uh, James Bridal is a, um, well, he's sort of a Guardian journalist, also an artist, also a technologist, um, a general kind of activist. Uh, and he produced a project for us called Five Eyes. Um, he's very interested in metadata in the um, collection of the VNA and how it is indexed, how it's catalogued, how it's, um, how it's uh, digitally recorded all the transactions, all the additions, all the provenance, all the um, dates. He, he created an algorithm which would uh, read the million plus um, digital records um, and create networks between objects by pulling out tags, um, which he then turned into a website which he, could, which he could use to kind of interrogate objects and chains of objects. It's very, I'm not doing it justice. It's a very brilliant, difficult, complex project. Um, and the point is, though, that, and, what, and the point that he tries to make is that this is, these types of systems, these ways of organizing the world, um, is, is what we're building today. Um, in, from everything from our you know, emails to our post systems to the weather to whatever you like, um, is, we're collecting metadata on everything. Um, and, and when you think about when all these things get linked up, what they can do and what they can mean. So Michael Hayden, former director of CIA at NSA, he sort of regrets this quote that was said offhand on a panel, but it doesn't mean it's less true. We kill people based on metadata. And the next step in that is autonomous drones, which can read the internet and the trail of things that you've read without any human intervention can decide to kill somebody. And we're, we're quite close to that. So James's piece, although it's very subtle, it's very beautiful, it sits here in the tapestries room. Um, it's these you know, glorious exhibitors of the stacks of files and the objects which, um, which, they, which this algorithm returns um, is sort of about that world that we're building. Um, and the, the Australia case, so, so it's, it's a very complex, but each case refers to one of the um, five eyes, so the intelligence gathering coordination between the Anglo-Saxon intelligence agencies, US, UK, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. The Australia case ha has some bo boomerangs in it, um, which of course is like, yes, of course, naturally. Those boomerangs are, however, from Gujarat, they're from India. They um, develop similar hunting practices. So again, the machine sees boomerangs, it thinks Australia, it's wrong. And that's the, the sort of simplest way of explaining, um, do we want that world that, where decisions are made by computers? Um, it's a, it can get quite grim. This is happier territory. Natalie Jerobajenko, is, who's an artist from um, Brisbane, but has been based in New York now for over a decade. This is a picture of her up on the roof wearing a bee suit with a daughter. Um, she was very much interested in the museum as, a, as part of the continuous ecology of London. So rather than being this fortress, it somehow has an obligation to give back to its context um, and to make sense of its context. She developed a series of projects, um, three of them. The first is a, a phenological clock. So it's a seasonal clock, 12 months of the year, which um, lists each of the, well, gives an overview of the activity of the flora and fauna, um, animals, plants, bees, bugs, everything, in a place. Um, she uh, worked with a local charity who collect these um, data points um, and made an um, amazing phenological clock for the main entrance of the, of the museum. So people can come in, and it was great, because you've got these um, visitor people, uh, visitor services people, and they, they would say to kids, what's your birthday? <laughs> and point it out on the chart. And then they say, well, the, the um, rare uh, butterfly is just emerging on your birthday. And somehow that simple idea connects it back to you, that you're also part of this ecosystem. Um, you're also part of that uh, world. Um, and she, uh, well, continued the project out the front with actual plants, which was very nice in these ag bags. And then we did an event called Moth Cinema, where we planted a 
native garden um, and encouraged some moths to come and visit it and then projected those lives of the moths onto a cinema screen. This is Natalie with a massive moth on her head. Uh, and then at some point she said, let's invite Julian Assange. <laughs> Which is like one of those moments as a curator where you just, you just dread it because you know you have to do your best, you have to work really hard to get that person in. Um, but you're just thinking, oh God, he's an enemy of the state. I work for the state. <laughs> what are we going to do? So, uh, anyway, Natalie says, I've got an appointment, do you want to come? So we went to the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, she, because she's completely insane, tries to record the conversation with an R2-D2 <laughs> sitting on the table. I'm not even joking. And then the security people came in. The first thing Assange says to us, are you trying to fuck with me? That was the opening meeting, and somehow we managed to claw it back to the point where he agreed to give a public talk that evening. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, it still makes me stressed just to think about it. It was the hardest day of my... And so I'm on the half rest, spend the rest of the time on the phone to the director, to the head of press, to the security staff, trying to get the okay for Assange to give a public talk. Anyway, I'm going to play a bit of audio from our interview. We're, we're standing here in the, in the V&A, a very big institution, a, kind, a cultural monolith in some senses. Is there a role for the um, big institution? Is, is there a role for the big state-funded uh, arts institution or any other type of uh, civic institution today? Well, you know, empires can do some things well. Uh, what are empires historically have done well, um, they've had, you know, all sorts of horrific problems, is that they create a safe environment whereby people can start their own industry within that safe environment. But yeah, I think, that, I think there is a, a role for these big institutions, but the role really is to lay off the content, to, to manage it like a wild garden. So I'd like to jump in, Julian, because I think this is a very important point. Could you articulate this kind of systems design, systems challenge of an open, transparent, participatory democracy that uses large institutions for the common good and the digital opportunity that new technologies provide? I think the issue is much more serious than that, uh, sadly. Um, I think we're about to enter into the golden age of art because the social political space everywhere else is being shut down. Um, art is the remaining frontier. It's the last thing left. Now, speaking to a number of you know, serious uh, political activists, um, a lot of them are migrating from calling themselves uh, journalists or documentary makers uh, to calling themselves artists uh, simply because the, of the increasing uh, encroach, encroachments and constraints uh, for people who call themselves journalists or documentary makers. So they're relabeling themselves in that way. And I, uh, so I think, unfortunately, art is going to go, go through incredible a vibrant period as courageous people find they cannot operate in other spaces Oops, I might have chopped him off there. Yeah, so, so after all that, he does make an incredibly important uh, and serious point that um, serious political activists are migrating to become artists. And I think it's very perceptive um, that they can then use the cover of, of censorship laws, of freedom of expression to achieve what they like. And you might um, ask, what is with the panda? <laughs> which is a good question. So that is, is a present that Assange gave to us, which was given to him by A Weiwei and um, Jacob Applebaum and, and Laura Poitras, who created this panda project and stuffed it full of the shredded documents of the Snowden leaks, um, as well as a USB stick with all of the Snowden leaks on it. So it was our way of kind of giving him a presence in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and a voice to speak from, and that panda is now um, in the museum. So it's, but again, that's a perfect example where somebody like Jacob Applebaum from Wiki WikiLeaks, um, independent hacker, Laura Poitras, 
uh, filmmaker who won the Oscar for Citizen Four um, team up with an artist. They're, that's the direction they're going. So this is a perfect example of what, of what um, Assange is talking about. The other, mate, the other thing that was weird about that was three Australians having an interview in the v &A garden. <laughs> oh dear. Um, and we've, uh, we've also acquired these amazing series of pictures by Trevor, the photo photographer Trevor Paglin of um, the three main intelligence agencies in the US. So there's another example where an artist, well, an activist has turned to art as a, as a medium. And I've just got one small clip of um, Julian to play because it's hilarious. Well, you know, I haven't actually seen a moth in three years. I had this very interesting experience the other day where there was a slug in my salad and I thought, my God, what an amazing, beautiful thing, an animal that I haven't seen in a very long time. So, yeah, it's, it can be a bit difficult being in such a situation, but it also uh, gives you a different perspective on the world. There you go, that's Julian. That's an exclusive, Assange on Caterpillars. Um, I've taken through a couple of, um, I'm sort of 80% there. Uh, ways to be secret is a, um, so we had these four main um, artistic commissions, and then we had two uh, smaller, more focused displays, uh, one on architecture and urbanism, and one on um, data and transparency. Uh, ways to be secret is one that I put together. I, I won't go into the details. There's, it's a whole kind of talk on itself. There's 50 drawings here, um, most of them new acquisitions. Um, it sits between, on the one hand, OMA's, um, AMO's flag for Europe, their, um, their new barcode, which we flew on top of the museum, um, which is an interesting thing to do during this discussion about whether to leave the EU. Um, and at the other end of the room, so from the scale of a continent, the scale of a, of a nation, um, down to this newspaper front page of Assange giving his um, sermon from the um, Ecuadorian embassy balcony. And it's an image that I've always been attracted to as an architect, as an urbanist, because it's, you can see he's in within physical reach of these police, um, but he's immune by the magic of diplomatic law, so, which intersects with the architecture of that building. Uh, and there was a whole you know, ongoing discussion in the media as to whether the Secret Service could pluck him off the roof of the embassy while he was having a cigarette, or whether um, the embassy no-fly zone extends infinitely into space. <laughs> so you just think, this is like architecture. This is where architecture becomes really interesting, isn't it? So that's at one end and that's at the other end of the spectrum. And then somewhere in the middle we have some more conventional um, architectural drawings. So I'm just going to do a quick thing comparing two images which we sat opposite each other in dialogue. Um, this uh, collection drawing from the Museum of Mies van der Rohe's uh, Neue National Gallery from 1964. Um, so Mies is designing, he's invited to design a national museum um, with, at the moment when the city is literally cut in half, it's still divided. Um, the memory of the First World War and the Second World War is still in many people's minds. Um, and how do you move forward? How do you take a brief like that and, to, and project into a public space? Um, and I think that's the question that Mies asked himself. I think that was part of the reason why he was commissioned. Um, and what he does is defer that question. So he creates a, a museum, a pavilion, which sits on top of a plinth, uh, a glass box, an empty glass box, which is in not intended to, be, to have artwork in it. So it's simply a vacant space for the public, for people. The galleries are then underneath, inside the plinth. So he defers this question um, and instead gives a space for the literal public that can then um, occupy this space in the future. We then sat that drawing opposite a new acquisition from David Chipperfield's office. Uh, this is a one to ten ceiling, a reflected ceiling drawing of the Neues Museum, also in Berlin. Um, and in a way, it's a very similar commission. Renovate a national museum um, immediately, the competition was run immediately after the wall came down. 
how do you deal with a building that's been substantially damaged in two world wars? Um, how do you bring it back to life? How do, what strategy do you take? And, and this drawing represents the actual, is the kind of place, the site where that strategy is enacted. So the, um, what you see in, printed in black is, is the um, original survey drawing. And then in various different colours you get annotations made on site by the um, structural engineers, by the um, heritage consultants, by the architects, by the um, client, by the curators. Individual decisions about individual cracks, which to retain, which to protect, which to replace, which to celebrate. Um, and it's those tens of thousands of de decisions about cracks which then comprise this museum. So the building itself is somehow made up out of decisions around cracks or what to deal with that, how to deal with that difficult history. So I love these two projects sitting next to each other and these are the types of tricks that we try to play through more conventional objects. Ways to be Secret was put together by my colleague Karina Gardner. Um, as I mentioned, it, it's to do with um, data and security and surveillance. Um, the, the key object here are the hard drives um, which were loaned to us from the Guardian newspaper, which contained the Edward Snowden leaked um, documents. Um, which, and these computers were then ordered to be destroyed by the um, government intelligence agencies. Um, I've got a video of Alan Rusbridger from the Guardian explaining the significance of, of these objects. And so, it, to me, it's more now an icon of the impotence of the state in the digital age. The British government, in the end, couldn't prevent publication. And the very thing, this digital space that they want to master and control for understandable reasons, is impossible to master and control for the very same reasons. It's the very same technology that makes it impossible to master and control, because information is now like water. Uh, and the agencies couldn't contain it. They couldn't keep it safe themselves. It, it leaked, as WikiLeaks had leaked before. And once it was out, they couldn't rebottle it. Now, of course, the, the agencies here are not the Stasi. But anyone who's read Orwell writing in 1948 about 1984, which is in the lifetimes of most people in this room, understand the, the potential for evil and malign uses of that nature of um, intrusion and of the dangers of complacency. So to me, this is, this, if, you, if you go upstairs and see this object, it's a, it's a hopeful uh, icon uh, about how in the 21st century, governments and rulers are going to find it actually very hard to repress and suppress information. And if you don't live in the UK, if you're not lucky enough to live in the UK and be a citizen here, but to live in a country where information is routinely suppressed, which is probably the majority of governments in the world, I think this is a message of hope. So I'm really glad that we were contacted by the VNA and Corinna, uh, who asked for, for these fragments, because I think it allows a continuation of what was, everyone now agrees, even the agencies, even the politicians, agree that this was a necessary debate, whether they like Snowden or hate him. It was a debate that had to be had. It had to be a public debate, because it's about the use of our data. So if we're talking about stuff that belongs to us, this is our data. The data belongs to us. So, yes, the data belongs to us. And I think that's the kind of point here. I mean, we get accused of, you know, courting media, of being sensationalist curators, but ultimately these are the things, these are the issues which are most urgent today. These are the, this is the kind of obligation of a public institution is to host these types of questions. Um, and that's what I really love about that, um, what Alan said at our opening, is that the, having these objects in the museum forces that debate, it forces it to continue to occur, it provides a kind of site for that place to occur. Um, and we host various uh, conversations around that object. But somehow, 
the object itself becomes a lens. It allows you to focus and, and reminds you that there's physicality at the centre of even these most ephemeral digital questions today. Um, so, just to bring us home, um, a couple of other projects which were... This is an insane uh, exhibition to visit, I have to say. There were like six main things and then we had 30 random objects distributed throughout the galleries. There's 12 miles of galleries at the Vinay, so you had to be quite uh, eager to see the whole show. Um, this is called a fair phone. It's a mobile phone that's made using non-conflict uh, metals and minerals. Um, and we very simply placed it here in this existing case of personal luxuries. So all these other objects are made of silver and here's a contemporary object. Similarly, in the metalwork gallery, which looks practically unchanged, the v and is also a sort of museum of museums um, for 100 years. We placed a contemporary security bollard. So, so the, uh, the sort of thing that you don't even notice in the street, but which there are thousands of them, we like called up the people who make them. Can we borrow one, please? They cost $10,000, so think about that. Each one of those things you see in the street costs 10 grand. Um, and they can stop a lorry going um, 50 k's an hour. Uh, it's of course more about what goes on into the ground underneath them. Similarly, we put these um, uh, what's called architectural spikes, uh, but they're actually anti-homeless spikes. They're the, they're the things designed to move people on, to stop them from sleeping in doorways and windowsills. Um, and that's again, that's an object of ethics. So we, we think that in if we, if we sort of look backwards to look forwards, in 150 years when uh, contemporary curators or visitors want to understand about the type of people we were in 2015, they'll look at this little thing which is now in the permanent collection and say they were incredibly ungenerous people. So that's a sort of, you can capture a whole society's civics in one little dot. And yeah, we, that was the sort of lead image the, the, this, in our um, New York Times review, which really got it. So again, we're trying to get the message out there. And this is a um, digital commission, which, we, um, which I just thought of adding in this afternoon. Again, to talk about the design of public life, um, this is a video by Kyle MacDonald where you can go on the website and annotate what's happening in public space. And you can see it's quite funny. People try and make jokes. It's very difficult to document. It's exhaustingacrowd.com. You can go on there and, um, and add your own comments on what people are doing <laughs> in the street. <laughs> so we've had Assange's caterpillars. Snowden's laptop, Russ Bridges' calls to arms, Ai Weiwei's teddy bear, uh, James Bridle's metadata. Um, it should be clear now that we're not really interested in like Mark Newson and Frank Gehry. Um, we're interested in the things which shape the way we live together. Um, and those things today are data, technologies, the leak, um, our collective relationship to climate, to globalization, to civic generosity. Um, design is not separate from these things. Design is not about lifestyle. It's not necessarily about the way things look. It's not about who designed it. Designs embodies, embody ideas about the way we live together. These ideas are contested and require public forums for the implications of these ideas to be debated. That's the obligation of public institutions today and the obligation of the design museum is to have this conversation via objects. Who cares? What's at stake? These objects stand at the intersection of our private and public lives. All objects embody ethics. Just as an archaeologist will come to understand a culture through the artefacts they dig up, we think it's possible to look at the things we create and consume today to understand the kind of world we're building for tomorrow. So the rise of the right, the attitudes to refugees and migrants, the spread of democracy, marriage equality and other civic rights struggles, the support of public institutions such as healthcare or schooling, all of this is about the design of our public lives. To come back to Hughes's challenge um, that every institution has its limits, well, if that's true, then let's find a way to kick them in. Let's
turn these places inside out. Let's make them do for us what we want them to do, to reinvent them, to repurpose them, um, and to turn them inside out. All of it belongs to you. Um, and I thought I would finish with this amazing clip, well, amazing moment, to show that sometimes it can just be that simple feeling of belonging. Um, this is at the, it's very difficult to see with the lights on, I'm sorry. This is on Friday night, the gig had finished and, it, and the um, curtain revealed itself at the art centre and we were all standing on the stage and somehow there was this inversion between the audience that was meant to be there and the audience that we were there. So um, I just thought, yes, this is our theatre. <laughs> all of this is ours. Um, and thanks very much for having me. <laughs>